This is the story of the project that almost broke me. So let me tell you why. I've got a client and friend who I've made some pieces for who really appreciates my artistry. So back at the start of the year, after I got rid of my table saw but before my new bandsaw arrived, I decided to try and use a 100 year old Maybiki, a type of rip saw, to resaw this piece of mahogany by hand to form the tabletop and majority of the components for a small hall table. Now I'm sure a bunch of folks will say, I bet that thing isn't sharp, and that's where you would be wrong, because immediately before receiving this saw, it had undergone matate from one of the finest in Japan. Long story short, Kobiki style work is just slow and back-breaking work. This is a terrible idea. I don't have any choice. I gotta do it. Sport mode, engaged. That is unbelievable. I am totally cooked. Really, I only need about 30 inches. It's a very small hall table. I think I only need about 12 to 13 inches wide. And this board here has a little twist in it. So if I nib that off as well, I can split that up and flatten it and also get my side apron. There is a little bit of unusable area right here. Just the pressure from the wedges caused it to just pop. It just fractured right there. Not super stressed about it. Pretty efficient use of material. One eternity later. I've been feeling pretty creatively stagnant when it comes to my furniture. Just trying to think of some cool things to do. And this is like a little cutoff from our Christmas tree from a couple of years ago. My wife had this idea that she wanted to make some little sliced rounds and write the year on it. And that's never really materialized. <laughs> I'll resaw it on the bandsaw to get some usable pieces out of it, some accents. And I think it'll give a cool story too. One of the things that I've always felt about furniture is that there needs to be some sort of story behind it. So let's talk a little bit about the story of why I didn't work on this piece for almost eight months. Shortly after my resaw escapade, my wife and I found out that she was pregnant. And while this was exceptional news, I started to prioritize working on things to get ready for that, such as building a new bed for our room, outfitting our daughter's room, and just trying to get a number of different things tied up before her arrival into this world. It was somewhere around September when I realized that if I didn't get this done before the due date, that my opportunity to finish this even somewhat timely was going to be in jeopardy, which is how I ended up in this mad dash to the finish line. So working with wood that is just inherently not square, you really gotta use that center line concept. Drop the center line through these. From here, figure out how big I want this. Now I'd use a smaller square, but it's in the house right now. I don't feel like going to get it. This side will be a little off, but that's fine. I can live with that. For the larger side aprons, I wanted to incorporate some curvature, so I made two cuts along the grain lines to give almost a faux live edge look, but just a touch more subtle. Uh, one has a little bit of a concave to it, while the other has a bit of a convex, and they're going to kind of offset each other visually. So you might notice that my grip from my prior videos on my saw is a little different. I learned a couple techniques from Jan Jaeger just watching him saw. He would grab his saw 
and handle it at the bottom. No thumbs involved. And what I think that does is it creates a little less steering as you're trying to make your pull stroke. And also it kind of helps you stay plumb. So once I get it going, I just literally grab with my hand stacked at the bottom, just like that. And of course I'm looking at my line following the line, but once it's set, the natural tension on the saw allows me to stay really straight and plumb. Now, another test to see how plumb you're sawing is to just flip the board over and see if you're tracking your lines. And here's the backside. I didn't get all the way to my baseline, but you can see that I'm still tracking my layout lines very tightly. This technique is really, really cool. I wish I had learned it earlier, but hopefully it helps you out in keeping your sawing nice and straight and plumb. I've got two reference faces marked. I've marked them with a circle. And by doing that, I'm measuring all of my joinery off of my reference faces. Kind of in the same way that I strike all my lines, I wanna make sure that all my markings are based off of my best two faces. It doesn't necessarily have to be perfectly square, but they just have to be probably the best two adjacent sides. Anything that is not square or not flat is not really at issue here. So I'm using this face to measure off of. I'm not worried about any warbles coming in from this side. All my components will be exactly where I want them because I am measuring off of the reference faces and I am creating a perfectly square tenon that is going to be inside a perfect mortise as well. Now, after listening back to that clip, I realized that I probably need to explain this a little bit further. This is a concept that's adapted more from timber framing where components will not always be perfectly square and straight. So regardless of the shape of the component, your job in laying out is to pull a perfect component out from within. So when I'm talking about a perfectly square tenon and a perfectly square mortise, what I'm really describing is unveiling this perfect joinery component from within an imperfect timber. This is also where centerline layout can come into play because when you're talking centerline joinery, your responsibility is to make sure that your components are meeting at those center lines. You'll see this with components that meet perpendicular as well, and that the center line of the mortise will meet the center of that perpendicular component. <laughs> screwed this up. I didn't check my work after I drew my layout lines. These two planes needed to be in line with each other. And the problem that this has now created is this component, this little dead man, does not fit here. My idea is, is that I'm just going to cut this off, hoping that my mortise isn't actually angled downward, so that way I'm not dealing with any missing material on the end grain of this post. I'm bring everything down and recut this shoulder so that everything fits. Probably a few other different ways. So I think in terms of what I'm trying to do, which is mitigate the amount of mistakes that are visible, um, this is probably the most sensical way of going about it. This is exactly what I feared that I was gonna find. I had chiseled past the line, which is typically not a problem, but when you're trying to correct a mistake, that's where this can kind of pop up. The solve for this is once I get all these cut, I'll just plane these down. What it'll do is just get this smooth and just try to keep this measurement between here and the top consistent. I kind of forgot that I had this little tool. This is a square hole drilling chisel. It has this 
chiseling squared end here, and then you use a drill to clear out most of the waste. I used this a long time ago on the timber frame barn door that I did, and I used it to put in these ebony plugs that were squared, and I kind of forgot about it. It turns out that this exact size I have, 5 8 pretty much fits perfectly for this mortise, which is totally coincidental. I measured it in metric even, it was eight millimeters, and it just nails it. I'm just gonna line it up here. Give it a little tap. Now this isn't gonna get me to full depth. I can do the rest of it with a chisel, but this will get me some really nicely established reference faces on the inside of the mortise. And the rest I can just finish up with uh, my own chisels. In an effort to make some more interesting lines on this, I just whipped up a really quick and dirty taper jig with some plywood and brad nails. I considered doing an octagonal leg, which I sort of still wish I did, but it would have taken some extra jig work and I was really pressed for time. Ultimately just a four-sided taper gave enough visual appeal and lightened the whole look of the table base. Got this thing test fit. This is probably the sixth or seventh time I put this thing together. Off camera, I rough planed everything just to kind of get the bandsaw marks off. I'm gonna pull everything apart and then finish plane everything. And then I'm gonna glue it up. One of the things I'm thinking about doing too is using epoxy as my adhesive. I initially had considered hide glue, but I think with this end grain section, being so brittle, it might just make a little more sense to have epoxy in that joint and therefore kind of strengthening that little zone of end grain where that haunch comes in. I've been spending a lot of time working with my planes to try and get that gorgeous planed finish that Kana is known for. I've been drifting away from hard wax oils and urethanes because I want to really highlight the wood and you can certainly see the difference in these components with the gleam from the sheared surface and the chatoyance that it brings out. The tabletop required a small glue up. I've done this technique in a couple of videos where you fold the pieces like a book on each other and then gang joint them together. Ultimately you end up with two congruent surfaces that seam together nicely. I didn't use any alignment aids like dominoes or biscuits here and the seam came out exceptional and by exceptional I mean absolutely unnoticeable. With that being said, while I paired a nice board for a grain match with it, what I didn't notice was that after wetting the board, which will mimic me adding a drying oil to the wood for finish later, there was a fair bit of color variation between the two uh, pieces. When I dropped it off with the client, I talked a bit about how that happened, and it turned out that he loved the way it ended up looking, so that ended up working out quite nicely. This is a weird little trick I learned from Jamil Abram when I took his class on the Amana bench. You basically shim your legs with coins and then scribe it to a flat surface and you end up with stable legs. It's probably a little more effective with chairs than tables, but being that this base is so small, it worked very well on this application. For finish, I'm going with a blend of hemp oil and tongue oil with a splash of mineral spirits. This part of the video is going to be a little deceiving in terms of how much time this took. I actually applied about three to four coats a day for about a week, with more focus on the tabletop itself in the later stages. I then flew out to California for the Kazurikai event in El Cerrito, and when I came back, added a coat of wood wax to the tabletop surface. All of the finishing products I use are from The Real Milk Paint Company. Use coupon code CATDOGCRAFTWORKS for 10% off at their website. And there you have it, delivered in the nick of time. My daughter was born about a week after I delivered this piece to its forever home, and myself and the client are ecstatic with how this turned out. Over the next few months, I'll be adjusting to fatherhood for the first time, so my videos will probably be more infrequent than they already are, but I'll still be here making stuff just slower. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.